that Twitter beef pop out. Pop out. My hip be on point with that gal. Catch over black it. You get stripped out. Bow, bow. Catch me down and name is watch I cash out. Cash out. And everything does end up when I step out. Step out. Call the call the case I had to bail out. Bell the loud man I won't snitch I'm not no sell out. The Jakes tell them let call your back out. Free up. And I write be the man for them I drill out. Drill, drill. Any off the till I pass out. They like Katie, get it busted when she pop out, pop out. I only rock the sign up when I pop out. Pull up in that form, then I hop out. Bag full of bands, brought the bank out. I only, only, so they, so they pop out. Pop out, pop out, pop out, pop out. I'm flexing when I pop out. Pop out, tell them, tell them, pop out. Um, and I want to thank uh, Commissioner Borgeson also for being here. Uh, she's been a very outspoken advocate um, up, uh, with regard to how this law is affecting our community in Douglas County and, um, and worked very hard um, to make that be known to others as well. Um, we have also with us a couple of youth um, who intend to give a little bit of insight about what they experienced with this truancy law. A truancy law with quotation marks around it because truancy is not even in the law. The, the word truancy, as you'll hear about more later, um, but it's an excessive absenteeism law. And we have Kylie Jackson who will be coming up in just a minute, um, and we have Jamila Morals right next to her. Um, and then we also have the director of the Nebraska Family Forum here with Brenda Vosick, and we have um, Sarah Forrest from Voices for Children. And as you pointed out, Senator Chambers, Senator, and um, and Gina um, Miller. Miller, okay. Gina's fine. Gina <laughs> Miller, a parent, uh, to provide a parent's perspective, um, which she does very eloquently. So um, after we talk a little bit about this, just, just, uh, uh, just saw. Uh,
introduce yourself to me after the meeting. Um, this group was founded by two moms here in Omaha who read the law after it was passed and said, whoa, this is going to have a lot of the unintended consequences. There's going to be non truant kids who are going to be dragged into the system because of this law. And from those very humble beginnings of two moms, our group numbers over 640 members today. And we are growing every day with uh, families who have been affected by this law and are willing to share their stories and to bravely come forward and talk about that. Um, a little history about the law. LB 800 is a very big law. It, it's about 80 pages, approximately. And way at the end of it are a few pages revising the mandatory attendance requirements for the schools in Nebraska. Um, and this section of the law was revised under the guise of preventing truancy and helping kids who are at risk of not graduating from high school. But if you read the law itself, like Melanie said, the word truancy isn't in there. It was physically crossed out, and the words excessive absenteeism were put in there. Um, people have differing opinions about the agenda behind the law, and I'm not going to speculate on that. But what I do know is that there was no truancy crisis, and the law is not really about truancy. And I'm going to hold up this chart. I have copies of this if anybody wants to see it. This is data from the Nebraska Board of Education. This is attendance data for the last 15 years. Average daily attendance every day in our K-12 schools. It's like, where's Waldo? Can anybody spot the truancy <laughs> crisis? <laughs> for the last 15 years, since 1998, Nebraska schools have had an average daily attendance somewhere around 95%. That number has fluctuated less than one percentage point for 15 years. And here is 2009-2010, when suddenly one of our state senators said, we have a truancy crisis, and managed to get a law passed that made 20 days of absence, no matter the reason, a crime. Um, not only is the word truancy not in the law, data is not even being collected on how truant kids are being helped. The only data that's being collected is attendance data. And so we are three and a half years into this law. Millions of dollars have been spent on all these initiatives to help these kids who are at risk. And we have no idea if the kids that were being targeted are being helped. What we do know is that the law has lost a wide every family in Nebraska and has transferred day-to-day decision-making from us as parents to strangers like county attorneys, social workers, and school officials. For almost three years, we've been collecting stories on our blog, which is NebraskaFamilyForum.org, from families who have fallen victim to the law. On that blog, you will read about children with meningitis, mono, asthma, autism, and other issues, being treated like criminals, being forced to accept diversion under threat of being taken from their parents, you will read about a child with a doctor's note for every single day missed, being served as summons by the sheriff, accusing him of endangering the health and morals of himself and others. That child is 12 years old. You'll read about sick children being read their Miranda rights by common criminals. You'll read about a little girl in Douglas County Court crying to her mother, what did I do wrong? You'll read about children being put in foster care for absences, not truancy, You'll read about parents being thrown in jail and children being made wards of the state. Every week we're getting more and more stories about the harm the law has done to Nebraska families. In fact, the immediate result of the law here in Douglas County could be called chaotic. The year before the law was passed, the number of children referred and prosecuted by our county attorney was 239. Those were kids who were really truant, kids who were skipping school without their parents' permission. The year after the law was passed, that number jumped from 239 to over 3,100. Those 3,100 kids were sorted out by our deputy county attorneys in what we call a cattle call. Uh, they're all rounded up and they're put into categories. They're going to be monitored, they're going to be prosecuted, they're going to be uh, put on diversion. Sick kids were put on diversion. Um, Kids were questioned publicly, pressured to hand over their personal medical records, 
assigned to monitoring and offered voluntary services under threat of having charges filed and being removed from their home. At the end of that first year, after all that sorting and monitoring was done, can you guess how many kids were filed on fractional <coughs> truancy? I'm not going to make you guess. I'm going to tell you. It's 244. So it's 239 before the law and 244 after the law. But our tax dollars were spent on all the sorting and monitoring and diverting of the other 2,800 kids, many whose only crime was being sick. And in the process, our role as parents, our decision-making role, was completely trashed. Our young county attorneys are asking parents questions like, what have you done to prevent your child from getting sick again this year? Um, they're ordering parents to do things like cancel summer vacations, hire tutors, and giving other orders that are outside the scope of their authority. There are a disproportionate number of non-English speaking families and families of color in Douglas County Truancy Court. And you're going to hear more about that from Sarah Forrest with uh, Voices for Children. Suffice it to say that, uh, not surprisingly, African American children are being negatively affected by this law uh, very disproportionately. Yeah. And Sarah has more data on that and she's going to share with you. Um, it, this has become a booming business. I call it the attendance industry. It's got a whole lot of new jobs and people working uh, because of this <coughs> law. Attendance officers, student personnel assistants, if you're an OPS, I'm sure you've heard that term. County attorneys, social workers. Um, it, it's a booming business and more than a million dollars has been funneled away from educating our kids to punishing our kids. And that is a lot of money that could have been spent to help people that really needed the help to help uh, families maybe that were struggling with kids who really are truant. Or transportation. And transportation issues to help a mom fill her gas tank so she could get her kids to school. That's not where those millions of dollars are going. They're, they're going to the county attorney. They're going to, to punish and monitor and divert our kids. Um, the NFF has been immersed in this law for, the, for almost three years now, and we think it's fatally flawed. We don't think we can amend our way out of this. It's a mess, and we think we need to start over with a new law that's really about truancy and really about helping and motivating kids to stay in school without the constant threat of being taken away from their parents. Um, when the law was first passed, one of our juvenile court judges made the comment that we need a hammer to get families to cooperate with the help that she and others want to give us. What she doesn't get, and what a lot of people in a position of power don't get, <coughs> is that our kids do not need a hammer because they aren't nails. Mm -hmm. They are our precious children. And it's our right and responsibility to make daily decisions in their best interests. None of our children are nails. Not our sick kids, and not the kids who are really skipping school. If a child is struggling, they need help. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be hammered into compliance. They need help. They shouldn't have to live under the threat of losing their parents and their home in the name of education. So the NFF is advocating four things. Repeal the current law. Replace it with a law that's really about truancy. It's really about helping those kids that need it. Remove law enforcement from the process and restore that cooperative relationship between parents, students, and schools who are the three parties that should really be involved in attendance issues. Um, we ask you to join us in those efforts. It's going to be a lot of hard work, like Willie said. We're just getting started. The real work comes January through March. And we hope that you'll sign our petition and put down your willingness of what you're able to do. It can be as simple as making a phone call to your senator or writing a letter or it can be as challenging as getting in the car and driving down to Lincoln when it comes time to testify. Um, so we're asked for your help, and if anyone has any questions, I know way too much about this law, so I, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Does anybody? Yes. I am a social work student at UNO. Yes. Um, <laughs> social worker. Um, 
I was saying earlier, I heard that there was porn about this, and I'm going to work with child populations. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just curious about the law itself. I tried to do some research on it before I came here, so I didn't look like a dummy. <laughs> but when it comes to absences, like no matter what, like if somebody missed, if a child missed 20 days because they were in the hospital, and they go to school and they're like, this is my child has a medical condition, that child can still go to diversion? That still can yes. go into the course? Yes, can. The, the law was amended in April 2012. It was not the amendment that we advocated for. We advocated for an amendment that was even tougher on truancy, but left the rest of the kids alone. Our definition of truancy is absent without the permission or knowledge of your parent or guardian. Left in the amendment was at 20 days of absence, no matter the reason, the school district may refer that child to the county attorney. And some of them are. Okay, what about those who have asthma problems? Who's the effect of uh, carbon emissions and stuff like that? And they have those serious problems and they can't come. And that's the situation that uh, Sierra Club is addressing this year. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out how we can help people to understand that. They figure there's no problem with our kids. If, if this is a problem, if we have with these kids, then if we would brought the numbers to them and say, hey, look, OPD, this is what's uh, yes. you know, your cold brain plants are doing to our kids in North Dame Hall. This is the numbers. This is the complaints. This is OPD news school is saying. We need to let them know, hey, look, our kids are sick because of the fact that some of them are real sick because of the fact they have asthma. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Asthma is a serious problem in Omaha. In fact, we've collected uh, quite a bit of data on that. It's a serious problem, especially east of 72nd Street. And quite a few of the children that we see in Douglas County's diversion program have absences due to asthma. Um, and when I talk about that diversion program in connection with asthma and connection with autism, my question to our county attorney has consistently been, what are you diverting them from? They're, they're there because they have asthma. They're going to continue to have asthma after they go through all this tort process. Um, it, it, and <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you except that it's very unfair. It's wrong that those kids are dragged into the court system. But right now, that's what's happening. <laughs> I mean, one thing is even worse. A lot of those kids that have those problems are being put in specialized schools and being bumped back to those type of situations. As Asthmatic people, kids? And after, you know, after the panelists speak, because maybe maybe what we should do is reserve some of the discussion um, for after that, because we're going to have like 40 minutes for all of us to talk together openly. And so if we do it like all right now, we're going to cut that short. But you have to okay. I just wanted to make one comment. My son had heart surgery last week, and when I talked to the school, the OPS school, they said they take that into consideration Right. I have to I have to leave you but just yes. because of that. On Monday we have a new policy that's coming out that will be reviewed for the public from all public schools. We will not vote on it on Monday. However, the following meeting will be the first time that we will vote on it and it will address exactly all the issues when you talk about illness that you guys are talking about. It just, we're gonna allow for four currently the way it's written, the board approves four days of illness without a doctor's note. After the fourth day you have to have a doctor's note. And that will not be turned over to the county attorney in those situations. We're going to have excused and unexcused. So we are addressing those issues. And come out, give us more information, more, more feedback. But we are responding to that. The reason why I'm just saying something is I have to leave. I have to be somewhere else at 6.30. But I wanted to make sure this group knows that OPS is addressing those. And we are going to continue so to address those. Thank you, Justin. Are you, are you, are you in, um, asking, are you welcoming people to come and speak at the meeting? At any time. When, any when is the next Monday, meeting? Monday, 6.30. Okay. Thank you. And, and talk to Gene. She's been honest, honest from day one. And she's keeping honest. So thank and you thank all. you, Justin, very much. And I, I want to say this. Um, okay. When you talk about <clears throat> our kids going to the doctor to get a doctor's room, in our community, all our kids can afford it. That's, That's right. right. So and we're going to be penalized for that. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a big issue with that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we need to have them address that because health care is a major issue. Mm -hmm. In our community. Right. And we shouldn't be penalized because I don't want to take my daughter because I can't afford to pay for another. Right. 
And, and I agree, and I, I'm so glad that the, the new OPS board has been responsive. They, they really have been very responsive, um, and, and hopefully this new policy will pass. But I do, I do want to say that this issue doesn't go away just because OPS changes their policy. We have, I believe, 272 school districts around the state of Nebraska, and many of them, including Lincoln, uh, they're, and, and a lot of them in outstate Nebraska are turning in all of these kids, even kids with, with doctor jobs for absences. And so I, I think it's going to be at the state level that this needs to be changed. Because how are you, you going to change that in 272 school districts? Does anybody else have questions? Yes. If I would like to take the petitions and stand at the steps of the courthouse and get signatures on Mondays and Wednesdays, would that be possible? Absolutely. I'll email them to you. I'll email a copy to you, Thank and you can print you. off as many as you want. And I know the senator has to go, um, and I hope he'll, he'll, he'll let us know um, before he leaves. But it's imperative that he get as much information as he possibly can mm -hmm. regarding this, because we're talking about repealing it. We're talking about repealing the law. We're the best person to be able to do this. But uh, he needs the, the information to be able to go. And we also need to make a commitment and go down and testify. And, and that's very important. People ask me, they've been asking me for three years, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? You know what you can do? You can show up when I ask you to. And I'm not going to ask you to do that very often. I asked you to do it tonight. I asked you to do it for our press conference, and many of you showed up, and I appreciate that. But I, I'm going to be asking our friends out in Sydney who are going to have an eight-hour drive. I'm going to ask them to come to Lincoln, too. This is really important. And it might be inconvenient, and it might take up your time, but I promise you, it's less inconvenient than going before a judge and being told that your children might be removed from your home. It's less inconvenient than going back and reporting to a young county attorney every month about why your child is sick. Um, show up, please, and, and we're going to need you in Lincoln. Yes? My ADHD is very short. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, spit it out. I just want to say, you know what really so surprises me is how many years later, just the naive, naive people in Omaha who think it can't happen to me. Oh. I'm good. They don't, people still don't know. And how do we change that? And I always say on my Facebook, if you're a parent, read this, read this, read this. Right. That's and how. I think it, it doesn't apply to me. It's, it's happening, and, and I, I think it's happening <laughs> disproportionately. In, in minority communities and people who are struggling with issues of poverty, and those issues are being speaking. those issues are being called neglect when in actuality they're need. Two very different things. But it's also happening out uh, in in Millard. Uh, we have some real horror stories from out in, in Millard. So it and in I Sydney in schools and drove my son every day from the hundred and thirty second center down to the time that's but, but it, is, it is a statewide attack on families and on children, and I swear to you, it can happen to anybody in this room. It can happen to anyone in this town, and, and it has. If we win, yeah. if we win, this law is uh, repealed, are you also pushing yeah. for uh, to clear the records of the children and the parents? That, that's something that we've just started talking about. I have no idea how that would even be accomplished. I would certainly hope that our county attorneys would not be holding on to these kids in diversion once the law is off the books. But I, I am, I'm not an attorney, and I, I don't know how that works. So no more questions for right now, If we can, just because we have other speakers, and then we're going to be coming back together. And we want everyone to stay for the conversation. Okay, so I want to make sure, because Sarah, Sarah Forrest, who is um, with Voices for Children, and can you tell what you do. Um, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll let you do that, but I do want to say that she almost didn't make it here because she's been in like an all day long in hearings, I understand, and they have done some really important research that we need to help, um, you know, make the case about what we have been seeing on an anecdotal level by talking to families. She's actually got some data that's really important, and I'm so happy that she made it to present that. So, if anybody wants to talk about that. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Forrest. I work at Voices for Children. Um, we are a statewide child advocacy organization. We're passionate about fairness and justice for Nebraska's kids. And we're committed to sort of telling the whole story about how they're doing through data and research. Um, so as sort of I've been hearing more and more stories about um, 
this truancy law um, and its impact on children and families, um, we've been doing a little bit of digging in state data sources. And so Willie asked us to share um, some of our findings around um, racial and ethnic disparities um, for children who are filed on in the court system. Um, so you have a handout coming around to you for those of you who are data nerds like I am. Um, but it sort of shows um, what the makeup of um, filings was in 2009 before the law passed and then every year subsequent up to 2012. Um, and basically what we're seeing is that for all kids in Nebraska, the number of filings in juvenile courts is going up. Um, but that racial disparity is getting much worse. Um, and the same is true for black youth in our community and um, as well as Hispanic youth. Um, we're still digging into all of the numbers, um, but when we look at sort of numbers of kids who have missed more than 20 days of school, 71% um, of those kids live in poverty. And um, when we look at the racial disparities as well, it's especially shocking for black youth because they only made up 14% of the kids who missed more than 20 days, but they made up almost 28% of the kids who the county attorney chose to file truancy charges on. And why this is concerning to us is we really don't want to see kids unnecessarily involved in the juvenile justice system. It has a lot of harmful impacts for kids who don't pose any threat to public safety, who don't belong there, who need their to have their needs met in other ways. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I just wanted to share that with you for some perspective. Is that data yes. available on our website? It is not yet available on our website, so you are sort of getting a sneak preview of um, something that we've been working on that's broken down a little bit more. Um, it includes information on both absenteeism and kids who are chronically absent, as well as what the court system is doing with those kids who are chronically absent who they choose to file truancy charges on. Do you plan on um, having that on the website or something? Yes, I'm hoping before the end of the year so we can inform um, the legislative debate and get that information out. All right, Thank I'll you, let Sarah. you get that. Thank you. No problem. Um, now, if Kylie and Jamila could come up, please, because I want you guys to sure. be able yeah. to be heard. <coughs> I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to challenge it too much because I know. Um, and Gina, I guess you could come up too. I'm going to just talk to the youth at first, though. Um, maybe you can introduce yourselves and say what school you currently go to and or and or did go to, um, and then we'll move on from there. Well, I'm Jamila. I went to Omaha South, and I left, and I joined the UNO slash OPS program, so I do college and high school credits at the same time. Uh, my name is Kylie, and I went to Bryan Middle School, but I left. After only going a month this year, and I'm homeschooled. So, um, if you could each, just in your own words, explain to—I uh, know a lot about your your families and about your stories. I've um, heard you speak wonderfully. Like Kylie spoke in front of the OPS school board recently and delivered her own speech that she wrote for 10 minutes, and they were very gracious to let you finish. Um, and. <coughs> It's because she had a lot of very important things to say. And, um, and Jamila, she's been very outspoken about how her family has been affected by the truancy law, not just herself, but her sister. And um, again, you know, we get back into asthma and allergies, severe allergies, um, but it's the stigmatizing of, of children and families that have caught people up. But, I'll let you say in your own words, how have you been affected or your families have been affected by this law? I guess I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my first court date was when I was 15 and I was put on probation. And I didn't go for until I was 18. But I never felt a drug test. Every time they tested me, um, we went to court. I had a social worker who said, because I never had any office referrals or anything, that everything would go fine, I wouldn't have to go to a group home or anything. But I've only seen her once, maybe twice. And so I went to court, that's not what happened. I went from court the same day, my judge sent me straight to a group home. Um, I was in my group home for nine months, and then I moved to a foster family. So I was out of my house for a year or five months altogether, I think it was. Um, in my group home, it was me and 14 other girls. 
and we ranged from kids who were just like me, just didn't go to school, and other girls who had really bad issues, so we were all put together. So I saw some crazy stuff while I was there. I didn't like it. Um, but the whole time I was in my group home, I was on meds. They told me I was depressed. I had ADHD, so I had to take meds every day, which I had never taken meds before in my life. Um, what else? There's a lot. Uh, well, but it's okay for now. I'm, I'm sure people have questions for you. Right, I do. I have a question. Were you, what was the education like in your group home? Easy and like remedial. It was really, it was stupid. Did you go to school? Yeah, I went to school, but it was like, I don't want to say it. Uh, we did like spelling words and I felt like it was like third grade level. So everybody passed basically. Mm -hmm. You were still at South no. at that time? No, I was at Central when I first went. Um, my freshman year is when I got sent away, and I didn't get out of the system until the almost the end of my junior year. So when you were in the group home, you were still going to Central, but they... No, they took me. I wasn't at Central at all. After when I went into my group home, I was sent to a Boys Town group home, so I went to their schools and lived on there. No, it wasn't Boys Town High. Like, Boys Town High and the group home are separated. So the group home school is different. We don't even interact with the boys on high kids until you graduate that program and move to campus. So when Jamila, when, I'm sorry to interrupt you just to, but it'll, it'll help inspire more information. When Jamila first told me her story, she explained that she actually was quote unquote truant from school. She um, was going through um, some really hard times in her family. She had lost a couple of family members and, and that was very hard for her. Um, and I'm not going to tell all the personal things about what you were going through, but it, there were serious things, and she didn't, um, I, I guess the approach to her, um, not being a violent or dangerous person to the, to the community, was really cruel, and, and it was very hard on her and her family, and she had never been in trouble with the law before, and she was immediately removed from her home and dumped into a group home, and she told me a lot of stories about what that was like, and it's heartbreaking. This is what I was saying earlier. Um, I asked them, like, no way, like, someone goes straight from your school, like, to foster care. So, did you have any any other charges, anything? No, just, just truancy. truancy. Yep. And they didn't offer, like, diversion or no, anything? No, I didn't have that. Probation. My case said that because I had never had an office referral or anything while I was at Central, that it would be a piece of cake and get thrown out. She would send me to, um, I forget what the youth group was, and I could do that. I went there for a day because she had it set up like four days before I had to go to court. I went there for a day, <clears throat> went to court, my dad just like group home, and I was, my social worker drove me from the courthouse straight to my group home. I didn't even go home to get clothes. I didn't get clothes till like a week later. Your social worker went to court with you? Mm -hmm. The same social worker that said, I'm so sorry, I'm a good social worker, I promise. The same <laughs> social worker that said, this is gonna be a thrown out of court case, and told and recommended to the judge, you still went to a group home, even though you've never been in trouble. No yeah, and I only had her for a week, and then throughout the whole process, I was gone. Judge I went Sirkovich. through like, judge Sirkovich. I think I went through five caseworkers, four probation officers. So I never had anyone consistent. It was always someone new. So I had to start it all over again. So, are I, I know that um, there's a, one more question back here, and I know we're going to have more opportunities. But go did you go? Okay, so did you spend any time at DCYC? No. Okay, so you never. I don't know. I don't know what I said. Okay. I just yeah, was curious if that had attention. Did you literally, did you just go to court and then? I went to court and as soon as my court.